Good evening. Welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. I'm delighted you could join us here this evening uh, for the final literature lecture that is a part of our Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. Um, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, in partnership with the City Council. I would like to thank them so much for their support throughout the series. I also want to, uh, to also thank our promotional uh, partners and colleagues, uh, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Arts, and the New York Landmark Conservancy, as well as the Landmarks 50 Alliance NY. So I want to, we are very grateful for their assistance in promoting this event. So thank them. So I want to thank them so much. Um, this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled that we came across this, uh, uh, this wonderful book, Seeking New York, the stories behind the historic architecture of Manhattan. And I'm going to introduce the speaker in a moment, but I also want to remind you that, of course, you're in the General Society Library. The General Society was founded in 1785 and has a number of different programs, including a tuition-free school, of course, the library, um, and, of course, this lecture series. And if you're interested in library membership, you will find it on the registration table. So I hope you will come back, particularly those of you for whom this is your first visit. Sorry, I realize I should have been sticking straight into the mic before. So anyway, thank you. Um, it is my pleasure, as I said, to introduce Tom Miller to you this evening. Uh, this book really describes the, how the ever-changing face of Manhattan is captured through its structure and its unique stories. And I think Tom is going to tell you a few of those. Uh, Tom Miller moved to New York City in 1979 from Dayton, Ohio, bringing with him a passion for buildings. He currently holds the rank of inspector with NYPD's uh, auxiliary police force. In 2009, he started a blog Daytonian in Manhattan, and I believe a number of you are readers of that blog here this evening, so that's really lovely. And he, the blog has now reviewed over a hundred, over a thousand buildings, statues, and other points of interest. So to tell you about the stories behind historic architecture of Manhattan, I am so pleased to introduce to you Tom Miller. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for coming out on a rather uh, unpleasant evening. For many, many, many years, I've been as fascinated with the architecture and history of Manhattan as I have been with the uh, incidental stories that sort of surround some of these buildings and locations. When we talk about history and architecture, we're very often talking about the great architects, we're talking about generals on horseback and politicians and titans of industry, but we very rarely talk about the incidental stories of the smaller guys that uh, make these, these buildings and monuments and, and locations more on a human proportion. And as I look out there, I see a lot of you are looking at me and saying, what in the heck are you talking about? So, <clears throat> as an example, St. Patrick's Cathedral. The architecture student, the art, uh, art student, and the history student who studies St. Patrick's Cathedral is going to learn about the genius architect, uh, James Renwick Jr. They're going to learn about um, Archbishop John Hughes, who had the foresight to build this building so far north that Fifth Avenue wasn't paved there yet. And they'll learn about events like the Civil War that stopped construction for so many years. But what they won't ever hear about is a man named, excuse me, John Matthews. John Matthews came to New York in 1836, and he brought with him the knowledge of making soda water. And for you, those of you who don't know how that works, you take calcium and you mix it with acid, and that gives off carbon dioxide, and you push that into the water and you get bubbles and I would admonish none of you to go home tonight and try that with my recipe because it will not work. But <clears throat> so 
So John Matthews used to walk by St. Patrick's construction site, and he noticed all of this um, marble chips that were being deposited from the masons and the carvers. And John Matthews realized two things. Somebody was going to have to haul away all of that rubble. And he also realized that white marble is calcium. So he generously offered to take away all of the white marble chips from the construction of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And over the decades that it took to erect that massive building, he got enough calcium to produce 25 million gallons of soda water. <laughs> he became known as the soda water king. He amassed a sizable fortune, and no one knows a thing about him. But he's a fascinating character in the history of St. Patrick's, as far as I'm concerned. So that's your example. Now we'll talk more about me. <laughs> about six years ago, an architect friend of mine was in town on business, and we arranged to have lunch. So he and I were walking across West 54th Street between 6th and 5th Avenue. Excuse me. And if any of you know that block, you know that the north side of the block is lined with nearly intact turn of the last century houses and mansions. So as I'm wont to do as we were walking across 54th Street, I was pointing out the... the um, Rockefeller House and the Philip Lehman House and the Dr. Moses Star House. And I was regurgitating all of these stories that make most people very annoyed with me. <clears throat> and Paul Anader said, you have got to write a blog. Now the problem with telling that to someone of my generation is that I had no idea what a blog was. So three months later after being harangued long distance, I did start a blog. And today I've written about more than 1,600 Manhattan locations, believe it or not. And that turned into the book. There's about 50 stories, 50 or so stories in the book. And so tonight we're going to talk about a few of those. But before we do, I'm going to talk about one building that sadly didn't make it into the book. And that is the one we're sitting in tonight. This building is fascinating to me because it's one of the early examples of repurposing a building. I'm sure most of the General Society members know this was not built for the General Society. It was built for the Berkeley School. <clears throat> Berkeley School was founded by a man named John B. Smith in 1880. It was a very exclusive, prestigious, private boys' school. So in 1890, uh, Lamb and Rich were commissioned to design this building, and it opened in 1891. And that's what it looked like in May 1891. This uh, was published in The Sun when it opened, and you'll see there's a little difference. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, right there. That's a beautiful split staircase that went up to the first floor, which is now the second floor. The ground floor here was called the basement in those days. So my favorite story about the Berkeley School here occurred in October 1893 and on a Saturday afternoon that, that day the Berkeley boys were to compete in athletic games with the nearby uh, Cutler School, another private boys school which was very nearby. They were very intense rivals. So that afternoon, everybody got on omnibuses and they went north of the city to the Berkeley Oval, which was the athletic complex for the Berkeley School. Then on the way back home, there was a little trouble. The Cutler boys apparently got a bit rowdy and the ladies in the omnibuses were offended. And it was reported that the Cutler boys were verbally abusive to the Berkeley boys. Oh, that was a very unpleasant situation, but the next day it got worse. When the refined, well-dressed Fifth Avenue people got up the next morning to go to church, they found that the walls outside here on 44th Street had been defaced with red paint that, gave, that said vulgarities and profanities. 
and Dr. Um, Dr. White's house as well was defaced. This was an enormous scandal. These were boys from the best families of New York City. So an investigation was launched and 12 of the Cutler boys were suspended from school. The rest of the boys were required to write apologies to Dr. White, but before they did, they were admonished that the culprit's names could not be released. No one was to know. And the reason they were given was justice would not be served to the parents. So in 2015, looking backwards, I think we can learn two things. Number one, even if it was 1893, and even if you came from the wealthiest families in New York and you were taught to be gentlemen and you had privileged upbringing, if you were a teenage boy, you were a teenage boy. <laughs> and the other thing we learn is that if you were running a private boys' school in 1893, and the families that sent their sons to you were named Astor or Belmont, you really didn't want to step on any toes. So, excuse me. This innocuous looking little Victorian building you may recognize, it's very close. It's on the northeast corner of 49th Street and 6th Avenue. Now, when the Cutler boys were writing profanities on this building, the distance between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue was much more than a city block. It was a world away. Fifth Avenue, as we all know, was lined with the brownstone mansions of Manhattan's wealthiest people. Sixth Avenue, on the other hand, had an elevated train that ran down the middle of it, belching cinders and soot. It had a car barn, it had a theater, and a lot of little buildings like this that had saloons and shops and a rather ordinary street. Well, in 1892, three Irish immigrants, their names were Connie Daly, his brother Daniel Daly, and their good friend Patrick, um, I'm sorry, Connie Hurley, his brother David Hurley, and their good friend Patrick Daly, he went by the name Patty, took a very, very, very long-term lease on this building. In the ground floor, they established Hurley Brothers and Daly Saloon. They brought in a 54-foot-long mahogany bar, and it had all the bells and whistles that a Victorian saloon should have, the carved back bar with the massive mirror, the built-in regulator clock and those marvelous little octagonal tiles for the floor. Now, by all reports, the three Irish proprietors were as hard-edged, hard-drinking, and rough as the blue-collar workers who came in every day to get beer or whiskey. Everything went perfectly well for the, for the men until the Volstead Act. And then they had to decide what they were going to do. And what they decided was they were going to keep the bar open. <laughs> so here in the front, they put a, a Greek florist shop. And right behind it on 49th Street was a fruit stand and a luggage store. And right behind that, behind an unmarked door, was the saloon. And they kept in business throughout Prohibition. Now, there's some people who would say, well, how could that be? Because Prohibition was not like two years long. It was a long time. The fact is that in New York City during Prohibition, there were something like 10,000 speakeasies. <laughs> and one of the reasons that was possible was that the, the politicians, and certainly our good mayor at the time, frequented these speakeasies. So they were pretty well, many of them were protected. Um, so as Prohibition was coming to an end, along came the Great Depression. And with the Great Depression, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. embarked on a massive, ambitious pro uh, project. He set out to buy up 22 acres of Midtown Manhattan property so he could build Rockefeller Center. Now, it was the Depression, so people who had property that he wanted were usually more than happy to liquidate that, that property. 
Now, on the opposite corner of this block, on 50th Street corner, was a very similar building to this, owned by the Baranowski family. In 1931, when Rockefeller's agents knocked on Max Baranowski's door, he told them in no uncertain terms there was no price. He would not sell his building for any price. Well, that was a problem for Rockefeller. And, but he didn't have that problem with this building. The owner of the building readily sold it to Rockefeller. But what he had to deal with was the long-term lease on the entire building that the Hurley brothers and Patty Daly had. So while this was all going on, unbeknownst to Rockefeller, Connie Daly reportedly stood at his bar one day and told his patrons, I've seen son of a bitch in Rockefeller's come and son of a bitch in Rockefeller's go and no son of a bitch in Rockefeller's gonna tear down my saloon. So when the Rockefeller men came to Connie Daly uh, Connie Hurley, I'm sorry, and said that he, uh, they wanted to buy out the lease, he told them, absolutely, not a problem. I actually have a price in my head, $250 million in 1931, in the Great Depression. $250 million was about what John D. Rockefeller had budgeted for the entire Rockefeller Center project. So now he had a problem. So he went ahead with his plan. He bought up 22 acres, and he built the 70-story RCA building in between Max Borowski's building and the Hurley Saloon. And there they stand, like little bookends. Now, a funny thing happened with Hurley's bar. The saloon that had been the watering hole for for decades of blue-collar, hard-working immigrant laborers suddenly became the watering hole for NBC executives, Radio City performers, celebrity athletes. It became nationally known because Johnny Carson used to mention it all the time when he made fun of Ed McMahon's drinking. And David Letterman actually did several on-air um, programs from um, Hurley Saloon. Well, the last, the last glass of, of beer was poured in September 1999. The 54-foot bar was moved to the east side. And somewhat sadly, the, the space where Irish immigrants used to drink whiskey is now a cupcake bakery. <laughs> but the little building still stands there as a monument to independent businessmen who refused to be bullied by one of the great titans of American industry. This beautiful pink marble memorial fountain sits in Thompson Square Park. And as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most poignant pieces of public art in New York City. In the last quarter of the 19th century, as most of you know, the neighborhood around Thompson Square, the Lower East Side, was filled with German immigrants. German was the dominant language on the street. The, the neighborhood was filled with German language newspapers and churches. There were beer halls and, and uh, German uh, social, social clubs. And the neighborhood actually uh, earned the nickname Klein Deutschland, which of course means Little Germany. The residents of Little Germany were for the most part hardworking, family-oriented, respectable people who had very little money, and they mostly lived in tenements under very uncomfortable conditions, especially in the summer. So a tradition came to be where the social clubs and churches would stage annual outings. And this way the kids could get out of the city where they could breathe fresh air and, you know, run around in the grass. The women could get away from the drudgery that they saw every single day and sort of forget their conditions for 12 hours. So on June 15th, 1904, 
the uh, German Lutheran Church, St. Uh, St. Mark's, staged its 17th annual outing. For $350, they hired the General Slocum. It was a 235-foot-long side wheeler. And that morning, uh, around 9.30 in the morning, more than 1,300 women and children filed onto the General Slocum for a, a trip up the river to a picnic grove where they would spend the day. There was a band on board, there were 35 crew members, but what none of those people could understand or could have known is that Captain Van Schaik, who was the captain of the boat, in the 13 years that it had been afloat, had never done any emergency drills with his crew. He had never inspected any of the um, emergency equipment. And as the boat had been painted and repainted over the years, he had allowed the lifeboats to become firmly attached to the side of the hull. There were very few men on board that day because it was a Wednesday morning and all of the, the men were at work. So about 10 o'clock in the morning, as the boat was just coming to the turbulent currents of the Spite and Dival area, some of the women looked over to the Manhattan shore and they saw people like waving their arms and they assumed, well, they hear the band, they see the children, they know it's a fun trip. And so they waved back. But unfortunately, the people on shore were trying to warn them that there was smoke coming from the hull of the General Slocum. A fire had broken out below decks and it, it finally reached a paint locker that was filled with combustible materials. There was an explosion and within seconds, the fire hit the first deck. Panic understandably ensued and some women grabbed the life jackets and threw them around their children, tied them around their children and threw their children into the river. But the cork filling of the life jackets had disintegrated over the years, it had become powdered. So when it mixed with the water, it simply took the children to the bottom of the river. Some children were thrown in without life jackets and they were either swept away by the turbulent currents or in some unfortunate circumstances were pulled up into the side wheel and battered to death. The crew grabbed the um, fire hoses, but as soon as they turned the water on, they exploded because they had dried out over the years. Some of the women, you know, tried their best and jumped in, but they were wearing long 1904 garments that were quickly sodden and, and took them under. Well, very quickly, the, the deck gave way and hundreds of women and children were plummeted into the inferno below. Two fireboats, 12 tugboats, and a, several other vehicles tried to get there, but it was too late. The General Slocum burnt to the waterline within 15 minutes. Of the more than 1,300 women and children on board, 321 survived. It was the worst loss of life in New York City until the World Trade Center. It was also the end of Klein Deutschland. There were husbands who came home that night to find that their entire families had been wiped out. Every single person who lived in the Lower East Side had lost someone that day, either a, a family member, a relative, or a close friend and the scars were just too deep for the survivors to stay on and little by little the entire German population moved from the Lower East Side to Yorkville. But before that happened a group of women got together and they called themselves the Sympathetic Society of Women, of Ladies. And they, they did fundraising and then they commissioned sculptor Bruno Zinn to create this beautiful memorial fountain. On the front, you'll see two children that are staring out to sea, and on the side, it says, they were Earth's purest children 
young and fair. Now, these women erected this beautiful, beautiful fountain monument so that no one would ever forget that horrible day when a thousand innocent people lost their lives. But as Mark Twain says, civic memory is very short. And today, hundreds of people walk by this monument in Thompson Square Park and I can guarantee you there's very, very few people who know or even care to find out why that's there. This is a most amazing building. I don't know if you recognize this. It's at 273 Water Street. It's one of the three oldest uh, structures in downtown New York. And since you're going to ask me, the other two are St. Paul's Chapel and Francis Tavern. This Georgian-style house was built around 1773. It's a long time ago. It was built by a sea captain whose name was Joseph Rose, and he amassed his fortune by taking his ship, the industry, back and forth from New York City to South America and bringing back mahogany. In the 18th century, of course, mahogany was not only very expensive, it was very well uh, it was very much sought after for furniture and woodwork and such. Um, Water Street at the time sat right at the water's edge, hence the name. Right behind this house was a private um, dock where the industry was birthed. Um, and the, the street was lined with elegant Georgian homes just like this one. Well, as the as the 18th century drew, drew to a close, Water Street was changing. You know, commerce was moving northward. It was encroaching onto Water Street. So all these refined families moved on. That's the history of Manhattan. Um, so in 1791, the Joseph Rose family moved out of this house. Uh, the captain's son held on to it for some years. And the first thing he did was to convert the parlor level to a shop. And for the next couple decades, the, the parlor level here uh, housed respectable businesses. There was a cobbler shop and an apothecary at one point. But then as the Civil War approached, Water Street had drastically, drastically changed. The street that once was a residential street of elegant homes was now the most notorious address in New York City. It was lined with brothels and gambling dens and all sorts of places you don't want your children to go. So in 1863, there was a young man named Christopher Byrne. Now he had already part, uh, was one of the founders of the Dead Rabbits Gang. And if any of you have watched the TV show Gangs of New York, you've heard of this. It was one of the most dangerous and, and worst gangs in Victorian New York. So Christopher Burns went by the name Kip. And in 1863, he purchased 273 water. And he uh, transformed it into what he called Sportsman's Hall. It was probably the most depraved of the locations on Water Street. If it was illegal, you could get it there. There was prostitution, there was gambling, there was bare knuckle boxing, there was music and drinking. But what it was mostly famous for was its terrier and rat fights. Kip Byrne built an eight foot square rat pit in 273 Water. It was lined with zinc and as you can see, there are tiers of, of stands so that the, the patrons could look down. In the basement of the house were kennels where terriers were kept. And every night, Kip Burns' associates would go down to the docks and bring back huge burlap bags full of brown wharf rats. So the men who came here would pay between $1.50 and $5 admission. And this is 1863, so that's a great deal of money. That was either a day's pay up to a week's pay. And they would bet on how long it would take a dog to kill 100 rats. And this lady right here, I can see she wants to know what the record was. It was just under 12 minutes. 
It was a gruesome, grisly, bloody affair. Contemporary journalists speak of it in very detailed terms. But if that wasn't exciting enough for these men, Kip Burns' brother-in-law, who called himself Jack the Rat, between bouts would step into the rat pit and for a dime he would bite the head off a live mouse. If you had a quarter, he would bite the head off a live rat. Charles Dickens could not make this kind of stuff up. So, as the Civil War came to an end, the reform movement focused on Water Street, obviously. And one, one man in particular, uh, Henry Berg, who later would go on to form the ASPCA, he made it his goal to shut down Sportsman's Hall. And in 1870, he did so. Now, Kip Burns still own, owned the building, so in an ironic twist, he rented the building to the Methodist Home for Fallen Women. <laughs> and then he immediately opened a new sportsman's hall about a block away. Now, Kip Burns really didn't get to enjoy that one because he died that year and he was about 39 years old. So, over the next couple year, or a couple decades, the, the house went through several incarnations until 1904 when it was badly damaged by fire and converted to a warehouse. Astoundingly, as far as I'm concerned, it remained a warehouse until 1979 when another fire gutted it. And it remained a burned out shell for 20 years owned by the city until the city of New York sold it for $1 to an architect who converted it to luxury housing. So there we have it today. You can still see, as far as I'm concerned, Water Street's a little gritty today. But you can kind of get an idea, if you've got a good am uh, uh, imagination, what this street looked like in the 1860s with no electric lamppost and sailors and prostitutes and God knows what all sorts of people on that street. Th this house has one of the most incredible stories in New York City. Everyone knows that building, right? The Village Cigar Store building. It sits on the corner of Christopher and 7th Avenue. It's been there for about 100 years. It's a little iconic little funny building with the front shaved off. And the reason the front is shaved off is because of this little mystery mosaic which sits right out front of the door. And the, you can actually trace this if you want to be really stretching it back to 1811 because that's when the commissioner's plan was released and we all know the commissioner's plan of 1811 laid out the streets and avenues above the established city. It was an amazing example of civic foresight that they did this. The land up there at that time was all summer estates of Newark's wealthy and farms. But because they didn't fiddle around with anything that was already established, 7th Avenue started at 11th Street and went north. So, in the next few decades, buildings came and buildings went, and one of the buildings that came was a five-story brick apartment building on Christopher Street facing north, and it was called the Voorhees Apartment Building. It was owned by a man named David Hess. And David Hess apparently liked his apartment building very, very much. And then trouble came in 1911, and that's when plans were being made for the 7th Avenue subway. The city fathers said at that point, you know, it just makes sense to extend 7th Avenue south to Varick Street, because what this will do will certainly facilitate traffic it will allow us to lay the 7th Avenue subway all the way down, and it will probably bring extra business to the Greenwich Village merchants. So the city, by eminent domain, took hundreds of buildings from 11th Street to Varick, including some rather historic structures, and they laid plans to demolish them all. Well, David Hess was not pleased with this at all. So David took Goliath to court, 
and he was going to stop the city from tearing down the Voorhees apartment building. Now, expectedly, he lost. So all of those buildings came down, 7th Avenue was extended, the subway was put in, and after all the dust cleared, the city began surveying because now there was all this raw property on either side of the avenue which had to be built up, including little buildings like the cigar store. Well, weren't they surprised when, after they did their survey, that they found that the corner of the Voorhees apartment building, now demolished, 50 square inches in the shape of a triangle, still existed. And they belonged to David Hess. <laughs> David Hess had not cooled down yet. So when the city came to him and said, Mr. Hess, we think it would be very nice if you would give us your 50 inches of land, he said, no, thank you. I'll keep my triangle. I'm very happy with it. Good day. So now Goliath took David to court. And this time, David won. So the first thing David Hess did was go out and commission a triangular mosaic to be inset into the sidewalk which says property of the Hess estate, which has never been dedicated for public purposes. Because David Hess intended that when we, in 2015, walk in front of this village cigar store, his in-your-face mosaic would say, the little man can go to City Hall and win. Now, just as a side note, after David died, the Hess family sold the triangle, which is really too bad. But it still is a wonderful monument to the individual. Are there any mothers in here who have a married son? You. Do you get all up in his business and his daughter? Did you know that there are some uh, mother-in-laws who do that? Well, this is the example of one. This beautiful Neo-Georgian house was built in 1908, and it's actually trying to fool you because it's two houses, two mirror image houses that are entered through a single door and then when you're in the foyer the, the separate doors go to either side. The history of this house can actually go back to 1880 if you would like because that's the year that Sarah Delano married uh, James Roosevelt. The bride and the groom came from two of the most uh, esteemed and oldest families in New York society. The couple had one son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and there he is in his cute little Highland outfit with his actually rather pretty mother. Sarah Delano Roosevelt was by all reports very domineering and very overprotective. And in 1900, when James Roosevelt died, she reportedly became even more so. So in 1902, Franklin was attending Harvard, and he met his distant cousin they'd never met before, and her name was Eleanor. Her parents had both died. Her uncle, Theodore, was the president of the United States. Then a year later, they bumped into each other again at a reception at the White House in 1903. They started seeing each other, Romance blossomed, and in 1904, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt proposed to Eleanor. And guess who wasn't pleased? Sarah was not happy at all. She refused to announce the engagement. She, she said they had to wait 30 days because she thought within 30 days she could talk some sense into her son. Well, that didn't happen, so she put him on a steamship and the two of them left New York because she thought if she could get some distance between Franklin and Eleanor that he would see the folly of his ways and that didn't happen either. So in one of the few examples that we know of that when Franklin actually stood up to his mother he wrote her a letter. He didn't talk to her face to face but he wrote her a letter and essentially it said I know how much this hurts you 
but I also know my mind, and I know it will not change. So plans were laid for the two to get married on St. Patrick's Day, 1905. Now here comes one of my favorite side stories. This is a great story. So what happens on St. Patrick's Day in New York? A parade down Fifth Avenue. And if you're the president of the United States and you're coming to New York to give your, your niece away because her parents are dead, unfortunately, where do you go? You go up Fifth Avenue, right? So the president of the United States totally disrupted the St. Patrick's Day parade. The newspaper said that neither the, the marchers nor the spectators cared and they were very happy to wave to the president. That may be. Um, but the great thing about this story is that at the wedding, the President of the United States gave away a future First Lady of the United States to a future President of the United States, and they were all named Roosevelt. Now, even the Bush family could not pull that off. <laughs> That's such an amazing story, I think. So Eleanor and Franklin are now, are now married. They took an apartment, and they left New York on their honeymoon. And weren't they surprised when they came home to find out that Sarah had made arrangements for a house for all three of them. So she had contracted Charles Platt to design this absolutely beautiful home. And it was completed in 1908. Now, if Eleanor Roosevelt was unhappy that her mother-in-law had taken it upon herself to choose where she and her husband would live, she was probably even more displeased when she found out that Sarah had interviewed and hired Eleanor's household staff. She bought all of Eleanor's furniture for the house and she decorated it in the mode that she would like. Now, the tensions between the two women, I think, were most evident in 1918. Uh, in 1918, the world was struck with a pandemic of the, of the flu, as most of us know. More people died in that flu epidemic than did in the entire World War I. It's estimated between 50 and 100 million people died worldwide. Franklin Roosevelt, by now, was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and so he traveled a great deal. Eleanor was in number 47, East 65th Street. Her mother-in-law was in 49, across the hall. And they got word that Franklin had been stricken with influenza and was being brought home to New York. So you can imagine Eleanor's feelings when the day that they brought him home, instead of turning into Eleanor's side of the building, they took Franklin Roosevelt into Sarah's side of the building. Franklin was back in 1921 in, in, uh, with another a disability. This is when he was diagnosed with polio. Uh, he didn't want to go to a hospital or an infirmary where there would be publicity. So he spent many, many months on the fourth, fourth floor bedroom in this, in this building. As Franklin's... Uh, political career progressed. The two of them spent less and less time on 65th Street. And in 1928, as a matter of fact, Eleanor finally just took her own apartment on 11th Street in the village and shut up the, 47, uh, the 40, number 47 side. Sarah remained there. And it, that condition stayed on until September 5th, 1941 when Eleanor left 11th Street and came back and reopened her 65th Street side of the house. The New York Times, when it happened, said that the house had been vacant for many, many years, and reporters asked Eleanor Roosevelt why she had decided to come back. And she said she needed to be near her mother-in-law, who was not doing well. Well, indeed, she wasn't, and she died two days later. Um, and within a week, Franklin and Eleanor put this house up for sale. It's, there were not very pleasant memories here. They went through and they picked out some things for Hyde Park. 
and then the house was sold to a group who donated it to Hunter College for use as a uh, social and interfaith um, center. Reportedly, um, Franklin Roosevelt was extremely happy that his house was going to be used for such purposes, and Eleanor spoke here at the de dedication. Um, Hunter College did two renovations. They broke through the mutual uh, wall between the two parlors and between the two dining rooms to accommodate large crowds. But otherwise, the house is astonishingly like it was in 1908 when the three Roosevelts moved in and a mother-in-law got her way again. So that's about all the time we have. I'm hoping you will take some questions. Oh, absolutely. Just raise your hand and wait for the mic. Anyone? What building is your favorite building? I knew she was. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's very, very, very hard to pick a favorite building in, in New York City because there is such a vast array and there is such a wealth of buildings. Possibly, if I really had to choose, and it would be hard, it might be the public library. Why didn't you keep the Daytonian branding in the book title? That, I had nothing to do with that. Um, <laughs> um, number one, it, it's interesting. The book was published on two continents. It was published by a London publisher and by Rizzoli over here. Uh, and one of the first things that the London publisher said is that well, we can't call it Daytonian Manhattan. Just, it just can't be. So. That was that, and you don't argue with publishers, you just go with it. I understand that nobody can forecast the future, but do you think the Cathedral of St. John the Divine will ever be finished? Oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the cathedrals of Europe took several hundred years, so maybe we can do it. <laughs> it's a remarkable building. You know, Mark Twain said that New York City would be a great, a great city if they ever finished it. You know, so it's sort of the same thing about the cathedral. You talked about the Barclay School before. Mm -hmm. When was it sold? Do you know? Offhand, I don't. Um, who was telling me today? It was... It was not long, at, it was, the, the Berkeley School was not here very long. Uh, I think the General Society came here around 1898 or nine, correct? 99. 99. So it was only here eight years. That's not true that they it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually they weren't the ones, it was the, the Cutler boys who were the rascals. What was this room used for when it was a school? I was trying to figure that out earlier. Do you know when it was a school? It was, it was an open drill. This was the drill? I was talking about that earlier. There was an immense drill hall here because the, the private boys' schools were, were um, regiment. Yeah, they were, they were like military schools. And the basement down here was a huge drill hall that had um, balconies around so the folks could come and watch the drills and everything. And it was all skylight too, skylit, correct? And if, and if you go upstairs, you could see that long before there was historic preservation, they preserved the windows. Those are the actual windows that used to face outside. And there is also a swivel door, which is a, a, a repurposed window that you come in and out of the executive office. So there's a lot to explore. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was actually looking at this room earlier from back there. I was talking to one of the people in the audience and I said, you know, I know there was this immense drill hall down here and I was wondering if perhaps this was like a smidgen of it that had been walled off. But 
The columns appear to be oddly placed, at least from my position where I'm sitting now. I mean, that, the two against the rear wall are out practically against the rear wall, and the other two are a little uh, more isolated. From right. Well, this rear, this rear wall is not original. Yeah, this, this, this room would have continued all the way back to the end of the building, actually, I believe. Am I right? This is all detailed. I want to give a little cliffhanger here, if you don't mind, <laughs> Mr. Miller. This is all detailed in a book that was recently published. We had a book party about a week ago. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, a history. So all of those answers lie therein. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> There's one way back. Oh, I thought there was. Oh. With the uh, General Slocum uh, tragedy, yes, I know there was an investigation, and they found falsified documents that stuff was being inspected and tested. And did anyone go to jail for this tragedy? I don't believe any. I don't believe anyone did. I would actually have to go back and double check that, but I know um, the captain, Captain Ben Shike. He did some very stupid things. For one thing, he tried to get, when he saw the conflict, by the way, he survived, the captain survived. He, he tried to get to shore, but he, he picked the shore that was upwind. So as he went into the wind, it fanned the flames and just made the fire worse. So he wasn't a very bright boy. Just a quick, a quick question. I've got the, just on my iPhone, the blog. Mm -hmm. How do you sign up to get it? Where do you sign up so you can receive it? Does anyone know that? <laughs> <laughs> I told you, don't ask me about blogs. <laughs> there, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a membership thing on there. You can, yeah, you'll just bookmark it. it, it I do a building every single day, believe it or not. Yeah, there's, every single day there's a, there's a new building. Monday is always a building that doesn't exist anymore. Sunday I take a rest, not because I'm that good a Christian, just because I need it. There is, or at least was, a building on um, Fifth Avenue, I guess, maybe in the 20s, that used to be, I believe, a piano showroom. And there is an inscription that's sort of faded. It's not an inscription, it's a paint that says Veribus Unitas, right. which I know was sort of the motto of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right. I was wondering if... Right. That building is on, the, yeah, that building's on 34th, 5th, 36th or 37th Street on 5th Avenue. 5th Avenue, by the way, was the piano district, and it started out, then I'll get to your question. It started out down around um, Union Square, and the Somer piano and, and all of those buildings, they, they moved uptown. The one you're talking about was, was a, actually was a rather small one. The interior of that building is remarkably intact. The stained glass windows and a, a beautiful winding staircase. Um, that inscription that you're talking about was apparently not original to the building. It was added later and it's not there anymore. It's been chipped off. I don't know why, but... Uh, no one seems to know why that inscription was put on that building. I've never found a reason for it. But if you get a chance to go in there, because it's got some really cheesy women's store in there now, like really junk stuff, go in there just to look at the existing piano showroom that was there, the, all of them, all the uh, uh, plaster work, and like I said, the this beautiful winding staircase with a, a stained glass window. It's, it's remarkable, other than the, the air conditioning ducts and things like that. It's remarkable what's still there. It's on the east side of the street. It's a white marble building. 
It's got a little arcade. I can't think of the name of the building, unfortunately. It doesn't matter because it's not, you know, not called that anymore. But it's between like 36 and 7 or 37 and 8, right along in there. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to make a comment about the wonderful work that they've done on St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's that that well is a work in visit. progress. They've never talk about never finishing a cathedral. <laughs> they they have they have just been restoring that thing since about 1917. Uh, they've just keep doing it, and because it's so massive and white, that it just has to be done over and over and over. But it is beautiful. Very spectacular. Yeah. You may remember, as I do, back in the 70s when it was almost black. Do you remember that? Wow. <laughs> Tom, Tom and, do, and you said you have lo a law enforcement background, did I? Yeah. I work with the NYPD's auxiliary force. I'm an inspector with the NYPD. And do you feel that your work in that area informs this in any way or it affects it or? Only in the fact that, you know, when you do this sort of thing, your, your eye, it's amazing how your eyes and your sight change and how you see the city. Because, you know, one of the tragedies of New York City is that everyone doesn't see it. They just keep rushing around and they know they're going to this building and that's where they go. But after doing 1,600 buildings, I, I tend to see things much differently. And so just, what's today, Tuesday? Yeah, Sunday. I was marching in the Puerto Rican Day Parade. And as you go up Fifth Avenue, you know, I'm always like, like looking at, at the buildings. And, and it's amazing how, how you'll see things. As a matter of fact, an interesting thing is this block used to be called the, the stable block. And this block was lined. That's why when... When the Berkeley School built here, it was really a risk because this whole block here was lined with stables. Some of them were private stables for the, the mansions and, and some of them were just livery stables and such. But it was kind of a seedy block. And a couple years ago, I was mustering up out here for a parade, I don't know which one it was, but I looked across the street there next to the, the hotel, what's it called now, the Iroquois or the whatever. Yeah, well, it used to be the other one. They changed the name. Oh, that's still? Okay. And there's a stable. And I'm going like, holy cow, look at that. That's, there's a stable that's still there. And there's actually one on the other side of the building, which is a little more dressed up. But the one on this side of the building, actually, I was just looking at it tonight when I walked over here, is, it's still there. It's the last stable on this block. So that's the sort of thing. That's actually the only thing that the police department does for me in this respect. See, I always say, don't get me started, because... <laughs> I just wondered what brought you to New York from Dayton, and what inspired you to go into this kind of investigation of old buildings in New York? Well, when I lived in Ohio, I was pretty much a, an amateur architectural historian then, and I was really into uh, Dayton, Ohio, if you don't know it, in the 19th century was a remarkable city in terms of architecture. And then in the urban renewal period, we just simply bulldozed the city, essentially. We took down almost everything of value. It was really, really tragic what, what was lost. Um, but I was very interested in the buildings. So that sort of carried over when I came to New York. I came here for a job, a job offer I got back in 1979. Um, and so I just, it's just sort of like came with me. When you, when you decided to research a building, did you ever uh, find uh, the owners or occupants so uncooperative as to make you feel as though there was something may, maybe not right going on in there? I'm thinking of the Collier brothers or something, uh, something worse even. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> normally, I was just talking to, to someone today uh, before we started. I, I normally try to stay out of everyone's business who are the current owners, and that's partly because of, of privacy. Um, 
and actually I was telling her about uh, the house down on uh, West 10th Street that I wrote about about a year or so ago, never mentioned the, the, the owner at all. All I said was that it was currently a private home which had been you know, uh, sensitively restored. This guy got in touch with me and just took my head off because I didn't ask for permission to write about his house. Well, you know, I don't need permission to write about history. And I, I wrote very little about And I didn't mention the guy, so, you know, whatever. But I mean, that's very rare that that happens. But in terms of, I know what you're trying to say, um, I, no one has ever, no, no one's ever come at me because they're trying to hide anything. Normally, if it's something like that, it's already public information anyway. You know, one of the sad stories is the, the uh, Gibbons house uh, in the village, or in Chelsea, which is uh, where the Gibbons family had part of the, they were a stop in the Underground Railroad, you know, and that house has been so sorely abused lately simply because, I mean, construction stopped, but it's because the people who own it uh, just are disregarding anything about his, you know, uh, landmarks are our history and it's, it, it's ruined, the house is ruined, but it's, that house has great history. Usually the more salacious the story about Manhattan real estate, the more valuable it is. <laughs> right? There's one way back. Uh, the old uh, police headquarters building, uh, like a Prince Street, somewhere's that around there. On the uh, southwest corner, it looks like there's a plaque that has been chipped off. I don't know if it's vandalism or what. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. It was probably the landmark's uh, bronze plaque that's on every landmark building. That's definitely a landmark building, this, so that may be what it was. It looks like it's actually carved into the stone. It looks like oh, it's really? a plaque, uh, you know, some sort of a city uh, seal or something mm -hmm. like that. It could have been. I, I'm not sure what, without seeing it, yeah. That is a magnificent building. There's one way, way back there. And that building is a trophy to Tammany Hall corruption, let me tell you. One thing we gotta thank Tammany Hall for is some of the magnificent buildings we got out of that, let me tell you. What are your go-to uh, resources when you begin to research a building? Are there any archives or databases that you... Well, I have a rather impressive, if I say so myself, personal library of 19th century and early 20th century um, guidebooks and things like that. Going up till about the... Uh, pardon me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, actual books. Um, like the... Um, Federal Writers Projects, and, and uh, those are the more recent ones. And then, of course, online, you can just go to all of the, the periodicals and magazines and, and um, court cases and, you know, real estate records and things, and I've got it pretty much down to a science now. This will be the last question. <laughs> Thank you. Questions about memorials. Um, I watched with great interest as the saga of the 9-11 memorial unfolded over many, many years and contrasted it with how we've memorialized other tragedies in our history. Now, are, there, are there other memorials to the General Slocum tragedy? Which, no, not that I know of. So that was probably, was, was that the deaths were a greater percentage of the population. I'm trying to create a relative argument. Yeah, well, relatively speaking, uh, absolutely. Um, it was about a thousand people, which is about what we lost here, I guess. Uh, and certainly the city has grown incredibly since then. So in terms of percentages, it was a, it was a much greater tragedy. In terms, in terms of that uh, tragedy, the Manhattan Borough historian, Michael Michione, I do feel I get an email once a year, and I believe they gather at that 
monument, and I'll, of course, verify that, but Michael uh, does a very good job of keeping that alive with a, a massive email base. So is it is, right? yes, Michael Michion. Um, I think we will now uh, conclude the evening, um, but I'm sure that Tom will be happy to answer any questions. But I also want, of course, to mention that we have this wonderful book for sale. I believe I think we only just heard like um, a microcosm of all the wonderful stories that, that are included in this book. And I just want to thank Tom so much for his engaging and fascinating um, stories of New York City. And we are so touched that you included the General Society. Ah, so you. thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> Um, I'm going to invite you all um, to uh, join us for some wine and cheese and, of course, purchase a book, which I believe Tom will be happy to sign. But before doing so, we would just like to make a presentation to Tom. Uh, this is Victoria Dengel, our executive director. And Tom, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, we express our gratitude to you for your partic participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. And as a native New Yorker, Thank you for giving me, more, again, more reasons to love our great city. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.